Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler, hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. For the, for the uh, full two hours, we are going to uh, welcome an author, researcher, videographer, to discuss the Essenes, this mysterious group of prophets and scribes who lived hundreds of years before Christ and their understanding of end times prophecy. He'll uh, reveal how an ancient Jewish calendar predicts the year 2025 AD as prophetically significant and the messages that the Essenes left behind for believers living in this present age. Josh Peck is an avid researcher of fringe topics. He's a videographer at Skywatch TV, creator of the Sharpening Report, host of Into the Multiverse, and is the author of numerous books, including Abaddon Ascending, uh, co-authored with best-selling author Tom Horn, Quantum Creation, Does the Supernatural Lurk in the Fourth Dimension, Cherubim Chariots, Exploring the Extra-Dimensional Hypothesis, uh, Josh specializes in scientific studies such as quantum physics to explain paranormal phenomena experienced around the world. He's been featured on TV and radio shows including Skywatch TV and the Hagman and Hagman Report. And his latest is The Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. Josh, welcome to the program. How are you? I'm doing great, Richard. It's good to talk to you again. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you. So let's start with uh, just a basic uh, understanding of this uh, this sect of the Jewish faith, the Essenes. Who were they? Yeah, and this is really interesting because they formed around the same time as the Pharisees and Sadducees. So uh, if people are familiar with their New Testaments, uh, it would be a couple of hundred years before that was when this forming would have happened. They uh, They actually, the Essenes believed the Pharisees and Sadducees had become corrupt, and they they believed that they were holding on the true to true traditional Judaism. Um, and because of that, because of that break off, they formed a settlement in Qumran, and they wrote and kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. So these are the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, and they were still around during the time of Christ. So uh, they were. They took what? Did they take a vow of poverty, uh, celibacy? What What else can you tell us about them? Yeah, they had they had different oaths that they would do in their community. There there are some um, there is some information that goes out there uh, trying to say that they were like communist and all this, and um, that's that's not. It, they had they did communal living, but it wasn't the leadership that was like forcing it. That was uh, it was more kind of structured around their their interpretation of the old testament basically uh so the way that the entire structure worked the the, the priests and people that would be training lived in Qumran and some other people as well uh that was like the epicenter but there were Essenes all over israel um yeah, i think it's josephus that said in every city there there were Essenes. uh so the structure it was almost like not in theology but in structure it was almost like the vatican um just without a pope so you have like a central uh place for for catholics to understand their doctrine and teachings and stuff uh but you have catholics everywhere so the essenes were like that too um so they weren't all priests and they didn't all live in that uh, area, but they did have a, a certain interpretation of the Bible that was different from the Pharisees and Sadducees. All males? Uh, no, some of, well, some, some of the priests were, of course, some of them had to take vows like that, but uh, there were some families too, even children. They were known to um, bring in, actually adopt children. Uh, so probably mostly males because in Qumran, they would have been, a lot of them would have been training to be priests, uh, but there were some families as well. So these, these uh, scribes that transcribed the Dead Sea Scrolls, where did they, where did they get 
uh, the original text or the text that they worked from to transcribe to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Was it they oral? Would have, uh, Was it clay tablets? Yeah, they would have uh, take they would have taken copies from the temple library that uh, Israel had at the time. This would have been right at their forming. So when they broke off, they would have already had uh, copies of all the Old Testament books and plus a lot of other books as well. So they just brought those copies over. And uh, so now we should talk a little bit about the, the the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found by this Bedouin shepherd boy in the caves of Qumran. I guess over a period of, uh, they were, I guess he originally found them in 47 and then they were uh, further discoveries up until about 56, 1956 or thereabouts. Uh, you know, he was looking for a, an errant goat and he tossed a rock into a cave and heard a clink and the rest is history, found these clay pots and so forth. Uh, but what is the, when these scrolls were discovered, what is the, the historical significance of them? Why are they important? Yeah, and this, this is fascinating. Uh, they're, they tell us about what's called the 400 silent years. Um, this is the time between the Old and New Testaments, and a lot of that period of time of 400, about 400 years is still a mystery. Uh, so the Old Testament ends with Malachi, and Israel is going a certain way, and it makes sense. And then the New Testament opens with Matthew, and everything is different. We have Pharisees and Sadducees, and uh, every, everything is just run a lot different. So the Dead Sea Scrolls came into uh, existence a little bit before this time and tells the whole story on how this happened. So we can we can use them for uh, for history. Uh, before the Dead Sea Scrolls, we only had some scattered parts of the Talmud and uh, four books of Maccabees and Josephus to tell us uh, what happened between the Testaments. But the Dead Sea Scrolls actually have a lot more to say about that time. Right, and they're also what the 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 oldest. Um, texts of the Hebrew Bible in existence, right? So they predate yes. all of the other copies, let's say, by, by what, a thousand years or something? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which that makes them historically significant too, because even before the New Testament was being written, uh, we have all these copies of the Old Testament in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We can, um, now a lot of them are fragmented, so we don't have a whole lot of full, complete scrolls. But the pieces that we have, we can compare it with our Bibles and see how they match up, and they actually match up really well. Uh, so were they written primarily in Hebrew, all in Hebrew, some Aramaic? There was some uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and some Greek. All right. And um, were all of the, uh, the um, let's say, the, the books of the Torah, like wh which books of the Old Testament... Uh, are included in the Dead Sea Scrolls? All of them except Esther. And there's some theories as to why that is. Why would Esther be excluded? A, a simple answer might just be they haven't discovered any or none, none of those copies survived. Um, there's other ideas about it too. Uh, some, some scholars think that it might be because there isn't an expressed um, like authority of God in that book. And so they may have left it out for that. But a lot of those theories are, are speculation. We don't really know why that book was excluded or if it was meant to be excluded at all. Uh, but yeah, all the books of the Old Testament are there and uh, a lot of other ones, a lot of extra biblical texts like Enoch and uh, uh, books like that. The Apocrypha, I guess we call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, Jubilees. And, yeah, yep. And what about... Um non-biblical texts like i guess what would we call those sectarian uh or not sectarian um, oh yeah like the community uh, rule in damascus document right yeah those documents uh they basically tell how the how the whole group was formed they told what the what the problem was what what the initial problem was and it's actually kind of interesting because there's a prophecy in jubilees uh and i believe it was i think it was jubilees was either the most or one of the most found fragments. They had a lot of copies of Jubilees. And there's a prophecy in there that talks about a, a time where uh, certain, certain Jewish people would reject the calendar. The calendar was really important to God. And uh, it was a solar can calendar and that the some of the Jews would, would reject it and go apostate. And the Essenes interpreted that as being fulfilled uh, during their time when they were formed, because the main problem was the uh, who would become the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, wanted to adopt this pagan lunar calendar as kind of a compromise to to get along with this with this other ruler. 
And uh, some, of, some of the Jews said, no, that's absolutely inappropriate. We're not doing that. Uh, and then some of them wanted to do it. Uh, well, apparently the ones that wanted to do it got outvoted because they, uh, they remained there and the, uh, the Qumran community left and started doing their own thing over there. Uh, so the sectarian texts tell us about the community, about the rules, uh, how just their whole community functioned and also the history. Um, another really interesting thing too, is they, they said that, that their forming was the fulfillment of another prophecy uh, having to do with John the Baptist, the prophecy in Isaiah about uh, making the way of the Lord and how John the Baptist fulfilled that. Well, the Essenes said, and in, in, we can read it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they, uh, and I think that it's in the community rule, um, that they believed that they were a fulfillment of that in, in some way that 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 was uh, supposed to happen. So that that was really cool because you have this um, you have this Jewish sect, and in their in their sectarian text, how they're explaining what their group is, why they formed, how they operate, they say that they're a fulfillment of that. Well, then we find later John the Baptist actually has some connection with the Essenes as well. So it's all really interesting how that connects together. Well, when I th when I think of the Essenes, I think of a very aesthetic um, ascetic group. Uh, as you you know, we we discussed earlier, uh, they lived very simply, uh, you know, kind of a vow of poverty and and celibacy and so forth. It it is very reminiscent of John the Baptist, you know, eating locusts in the desert and and so forth. Uh, was he perhaps inspired by the Essenes? Was he was he in a scene? There's actually a lot of reasons to think that might be the case. I've, uh, in studying this, I've become convinced that he was probably a, a part of that co community. Um, but first, the Essenes, like I said, they believe that they were to fulfill Isaiah 40, verse 3, about the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, it was a big part of why they went out there in the first place. But we find out that John was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Like you mentioned, he had a diet of locusts. And as I show in my book, this, this is really interesting how the Gospels give us these, uh, oh, scripture really just give, gives us these weird little details. A good, friend, a good friend of mine, Dr. Mike Heiser says, when it comes to the Bible study, if it's weird, it's important. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so it's weird that it just happens to mention that he ate locusts. How strange. Well, uh, John had the diet of locusts, but um, locusts were not a common food in Israel at the time, except in Qumran, where we actually find instructions on how to prepare locusts for food. And I believe that was in the community rule as well. Uh, but we also have John's father worked in the temple. But for some reason, we don't see John following that tradition. So if he was working in the temple, he would have been a, a Pharisee. And we know that um, and he had this encounter with the angel, probably we now we'll, we can fill in some of the gaps. This is guesswork on my part, but what I think happened, he probably rejected the Pharisee way after that encounter with the angel because he 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 would have been familiar enough with a, a scene, you know, theology to understand what prophecy they believed they were going to fulfill. And I think after that angel encounter, and I think that that might have been why he laughed at first too, and the, the angel had to, had to shut him up for a while. But uh, he probably decided to reject Pharisee, uh, the Pharisee way, and um, probably took John, because he was the next in line, took John over to the Essenes to be discipled there, uh, because that was something that they were known for doing. So, uh, so maybe for some reason, if that or something else, for some reason, John went to live with the Essenes. Also, what's interesting is John was baptizing uh, before Jesus comes on the scene. And the Essenes were actually known for ritual bathings, exactly like that. It was a part of an initiation into that understanding, into that theology, that way of reading the scriptures and that way of uh, living in their community. So that's really cool that that's where baptism comes from. It's, it's a much older, older tradition. Uh, probably going back to just original uh, Judaism before before the apostasy took place in probably around two to three hundred, well, three to two hundred BC, somewhere in that area. Uh, so, why why did they split? There's like the three main, I guess, branches of of or three sects of Judaism. You mentioned the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the uh, uh, the Essenes. 
uh, was it was it over the calendar, or was there a, was there another reason that they split off? It seems like at least the reason that the Essenes were in Qumran was over the calendar between the Pharisees and. Sadducees. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes called the Pharisees the sons of darkness. Uh, and they call them that as kind of a kind of a dig because they, in the Essene mind, they accepted this lo lunar pagan calendar. Um, so they called them the sons of darkness. They called the Sadducees the seekers of smooth things. And what they meant by that is uh, the way the Essenes understood it, the uh, a Sadducee would be somebody who would say, just go along with the government. Let's take it easy. There's no afterlife anyway. So let's try to have the best life we can here. Um, so radically different theologies, uh, all three of them. But those were the, the three main ones and why they split. Uh, um, the, uh, the Essene calendar that you mentioned, tell me a little bit more about that. Is that, is that found in the Bible? Yeah, well, not explicitly, but I believe that that is what the Bible uses. Um, so according to the Essenes, they were using the original calendar that God gave to Adam. And the Essenes would say that the calendar of the Pharisees was pagan and corrupt. Uh, but apparently sometime during the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Jew Jewish leadership were required to use this pagan, lunar pagan calendar. And some went along with it, some didn't. Um, but the Essenes claimed to keep the original calendar. Uh, now, if you try to map out the events of, say, Noah's flood, because if they make that claim, we have the original calendar, well, that calendar should still be in our Bibles. Uh, and in, in fact, it, it, it's, I haven't found a mistake yet. It seems to be there. Um, for example, if you try to map out the events of uh, Noah's flood on any other calendar, it just doesn't work. You'll always be a day or two off somewhere. But on the Essene calendar, so it matches perfectly. Uh, same with the events of Moses and his meeting with God. The day counts, uh, they don't work on any other calendar. Uh, most re relevant to us is, um, I, I believe that it's the Essene calendar that end times prophecy in the Bible is based on. And in the book, I go through several future prophecies from Daniel and Revelation and others to show how the day counts line up actually really perfectly with the Essene calendar uh, with events even falling on feast days and things. Um, so the, the calendar itself, it was split up differently than ours. So they basically had an understanding of human history of 7,000 complete years. They saw one giant complete week, like one uh, seven year or 7,000 year period. Uh, now, just like we have millennia, centuries, decades, and years, the Essene had ages, which were 2,000 years. They had onas, uh, which were uh, 500 years. Jubilees, which was 50 years. Shemitahs, seven, and then normal years. Um, so they actually had these ages mapped out. The way that, if we're understanding their calendar correctly, and if, if we're getting our days right, then uh, they, they would have said their age of Torah, that's what the... 2000 year period they were living in, their age of Torah would have concluded in 75 AD. And it was only a couple of years before that they had the destruction of the temple. Uh, so the way that they had the 7,000 year history work is uh, from creation to the call of Abraham, that was the age of creation or age of chaos, from the call of Abraham to uh, 75 AD was the age of Torah. Um, and from 75, AD to presumably <laughs> 2075 uh, AD is the age of grace. And which is interesting that they actually call it that in, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then the last thousand years is the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ, the last 1000 years, it's like a half age, it's a Sabbath age. And that completes the, the whole 7,000 years. And then after that, it's a, it's a new creation. Uh, so that, that is really interesting to me. That, that, so that kind of shows how their um, kind of yearly calendar worked. It was, it was a solar calendar and more how uh, it, it worked kind of broadly. Were they, uh, were they apocalyptic? Yeah, yeah. They had a lot of, uh, well, they had the Book of Enoch, and that's about one of the most apocalyptic books <laughs> besides Revelation that you can read. But uh, yeah, they had, a, they had a lot of beliefs about end times. They mainly talked about their age and the end of their age. Uh, but they had a little bit, a little bit to say about ours. Um, 
uh, mainly surrounding the idea of apostasy that basically the world will just kind of go nuts right before the end, uh, which, you know, look out the window. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to take a, a time out here. We'll come back and continue to discuss the Essenes and the Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. And just as we roll into a break, uh, let me just take care of some quick business here. I want to uh, give a quick shout out to three of our Patreon uh, donors in the Star Chamber tier, Tim Sullivan, Deep Paul, and Tim T. Thank you, uh, all three of you. Your, uh, your monthly support and donations mean so much to me. It helps us to continue the work that we do here. Once again, Tim Sullivan, Deep Paul, and Tim T, our Star Chamber tier uh, Patreon supporters. And if you'd like to uh, consider becoming an official donor, you can uh, go to patreon.com slash strangeplanet, patreon.com slash strangeplanet, a number of tiers to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you. But as always, any monthly donation, greatly appreciated. All right, back to uh, more of my conversation with Josh Peck right after these. I call it the Miracle Molecule, Carbon 60 or C60 for my good friends at C60Evo.com. And I take a tablespoon every morning. It delivers more than 172 times the power of vitamin C. C60 is a known antiviral, antioxidant, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. It's a remedy that works. C60 Evo users consistently enjoy better sleep and wake up feeling refreshed. This alone is worth the cost of the bottle. I sleep like a baby. I have no aches or pains. Zero. I'm 58 and I don't have a gray hair on my head. Get your miracle in a bottle. C60 from c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. Use the coupon code EVRS at checkout and save an additional 10%. This statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. If you have a medical concern, please contact your healthcare provider. Have you subscribed to my newsletter yet? It's fast, easy, and absolutely free. Just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and then click on subscribe. All I need is your email address, and that's it. Then, once a month, you'll receive my newsletter, Inner Sanctum, in your email inbox. The Inner Sanctum contains a monthly brief, a column of my analysis of the news and opinions. There's a This Month in UFO or Conspiracy History, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of this radio program, a book club, my podcast pick of the month, a spotlight on a previous guest, and much more. Join the Strange Planet community by signing up for your free subscription to Inner Sanctum. Again, go to strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and click on subscribe. It's a strange planet. Read all about it. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Follow Richard on Twitter at Richard Serrett. For show information, visit the website strangeplanet.ca. And we are back with Josh Peck, the author of The Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. We're talking about the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, were the Essenes uh, apolitical or were they revolutionaries? What, 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 were they, well, what was yeah, their philosophy? It, yeah, it's, it's tough with politics because um, in Israel at that time, politics and religion were basically the same. They were wrapped up together. I mean, their, their civil law, the way that Israel ran was the Torah. <laughs> and uh, so politically, I mean, the, the obedient ones would have been that, they, they would have just been Torah followers. Uh, but then you had the Pharisees who pretty much ran everything at that time. Um, politically, the, the Pharisees, are kind of, they, they mainly just wanted the power. And as uh, far as the Sadducees, they didn't really care. They, they figured whoever was in power, just do what they say. And let's, let's have a really easy life. Uh, so, yeah. So politically, I mean, ma mainly just what the, the Torah would say and direct them. That's what they tried to do. Uh, did the Essenes um, have any uh, knowledge as to the whereabouts of um uh, you know, Solomon's temple and the treasures of Solomon's temple? 
it's possible with that there's one weird scroll called the copper scroll i only dedicated a, a brief uh part in my book to it because there's already been a lot of books written about it and um I didn't want to get too much into it because it's a whole rabbit trail, but basically there was this copper scroll found and it seems to list items and possibly where they're buried. Uh, so it's been studied and analyzed if that if that is accurate. Um, but because of the political tension in Israel right now, nobody can go and check it out and dig and stuff. But if that's accurate, then that might be uh, some of the location of some of the temple pieces, maybe even the Ark of the Covenant. Who knows? Um, so getting back to these, uh, these different ages of the Essenes, um, they say our age, our present age, doesn't end until 2075, so 50-some years from now. Does that mean we won't see the prophecy being fulfilled until then? Possibly not. This is, this is what, what is really cool. Between these ages, the, the previous jubilee of 50 years, there seems to be a transition point. So... Uh, with the events, you can't really like point down a single date and say, this is where this age began and this one ends because the the age that's to come, at least so far, started a little bit before the the last age ended. So we easiest way to think about this is we would probably say that the church started like Christianity, the church started probably Pentecost or somewhere around that time, but we wouldn't say 75 AD. So we would say that our church age kind of started there, but the 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 Essene calendar would have the date at 75 AD. So these the the end of one age and the beginning of another seem to blend together. Now, if that is true, if that's accurate, then in 2025 we'll be entering the final jubilee of our age, which if this keeps going might mean the next age, the next age to come might blend in a little bit. So there's a lot of different ways that this could happen. Um, we could have a really early tribulation and let's say 2025 comes and that second the tribulation starts. And by the way, I'm, I don't, I'm not setting dates or anything. I'm just, just hypothetically. Um, well, we could have the whole thing finish and then, uh, you know, Jesus returns after that. So thir 32 2032, which would be interesting, but um, uh, yeah, he, he would come back in 2032 AD, but if the age to come doesn't end until 75, but there's this blending thing, it might be that that's when people get instructions on how the next age is going to work. A, a lot of times we have this idea that uh, or people who would take it literally anyway, that when Jesus comes, he's going to clap his hands and everything's going to be perfect. And I, I don't think he's going to do it like that. I, I think there, there's going to be a, a cleanup effort. You know, I mean, he, we know that he uses the, the birds to clean up Armageddon, uh, but there's going to there's gonna be new buildings. There's going to be a new temple. There's, there's this whole new structure. How long does it take to teach the surviving world uh, how this new world is going to work? So it, that could be that could be a decades gap, uh, and maybe at probably Pentecost because that was uh, like the the initiation of the new age uh, according to the Essenes at Pentecost that uh, 2075 possibly that would be when the millennial age would start in that scenario. Uh, there's other ideas too. Um, if uh, if some of your listeners are a pre-trib rapture believer, uh, you could have a really early rapture. But it's not the rapture that starts the tribulation. It's the signing of the covenant with many. So let's just say hypothetically, as, as crazy as it may sound, let's just say a, a bunch of Christians disappear off the earth one day. Well, the rest of the world is going to at least be familiar with the idea of that. And, you know, I mean, word's going to get around, hey, was that the rapture? Well, let's say they thought that that was going to start the tribulation. But let's say seven years go by and no incident, no antichrist no second coming of Jesus, just everything's going on as it was. Well, let's say a few decades of that go by. Now you got a whole new generation uh, that, that it, it, would, it would seem silly, like archaic to, to believe in Christianity and believe that was the rapture and clearly it wasn't. So then when the tribulation, if it comes late, let's say uh, 2068, if uh, the tribulation starts then, uh, that could be why like, that could be why so many people, when you read the book of Revelation, so many people have a hard time accepting what's going on, a uh, hard time believing it. To, to me, it seems like if a rapture happened, I mean, 
it, it would be really hard to spin that story, I think, you know, but there would be a lot of people that would come to faith pretty much immediately after seeing that and realizing that they missed their chance. Uh, so I don't know for sure, but th those are just a couple hypothetical situations. So the Essenes were, were Jews. Yes. Um, how, how did they inform the New Testament, if at all, or impact or influence the New Testament? So this is really cool because this might be what happened to the Essenes. So there's this big mystery. Where did the Essenes go? Um, nobody knows what happened to them, where they went, or why. Well, if the Essene, when you read Essene theology through the Dead Sea Scrolls, you actually find out it, it, it tracks really closely with just things that we know in Christianity, um, and especially their view of the Messiah. So they believed that and there's even a there's even a prophecy in the Dead Sea Scroll about the, the Messiah coming, dying for sins, uh, being God in the flesh. And they, they may not have known all the particulars on how it was all going to work, but they knew those things to be true. And they even put the year at 32 AD when this would happen. Uh, and then, of course, so we have the, the crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus. So before Jesus, all of this type of theology, these type of interpretations that today we would just accept as normal kind of Christian interpretations of the Old Testament, they, they already had all that and they were teaching that and looking forward to the day that this was coming and they even knew the day. So when Jesus comes on the scene, uh, and, and this is funny too, I, I think this is why sometimes uh, Jesus can just like blink his eyes and 5,000 people are saved, but sometimes uh, he, he'll go on and explain and talk and, and try, try to try to get somebody there and they just w won't have it. I think the ones that are easier converted, it's because they were already expecting this. And those were probably Essenes. So if that's true, the Essenes would have become believers immediately. They would have accepted Messiah. And then the Messiah would give the Great Commission. So I think what happened is they were the first Christians. They took the temple library and they went out to the nations and spread Christianity. So uh, that, that seems to make the most sense when you look at history. So we may actually come from the Essenes being Christians, which is really cool to think about. Uh, some have speculated that maybe Jesus came from that sect as well. Is that possible? Right. He probably taught them uh, for sure. Actually, there's a lot of uh, prophecy, possible prophecies in the Dead Sea Scrolls about Jesus, the Messiah, coming in and teaching. Um, but I wouldn't say that he was in a scene, just like if he came back today, he wouldn't be a Baptist or a Catholic or, you know, Orthodox or, you know, whatever. He wouldn't be any of those things. He would be Jesus and he would one one of those interpretations would be like the closest <laughs> so um so you know let's say uh, well so back then they would have they would have already existed and then jesus would have come and taught them but jesus even corrected some things because the essenes weren't perfect either i mean they they were great and and there's a lot of awesome stuff in the dead sea scrolls but they they still had some things wrong too um you know, I believe that uh, John, John and James probably were Essenes as well because they were uh, disciples of um, John the Baptist. So they likely were, were well, when they went uh, to, oh, I believe it was Samaria, uh, they, they were saying, should we just rain down fire on and just end it all? <laughs> and, and that's so Essene when you read the Dead Sea Scrolls because they talk like that in there. They, they're like, they, they like hate their enemies and stuff. And so Jesus even has to correct them a little bit on that. Um, there's actually a, an interesting theory that, and I, I don't know if I, I couldn't really find anything. I'm going to get that, you hold on to that. Par, uh, pardon the interruption, Josh. We're going to take a quick time out. We'll come back and, uh, and get to uh, more of our conversation. Josh Peck, author of The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, uh, back with more in a moment. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. A trusted sponsor of my show, GetTheTea.com, is having their summer sale. Hey guys, let's talk about Father's Day. What kind of gift would you like to give your dad? Why not think about a gift that would help his digestion? Remember, Life Change Tea is an amazing gentle cleanse that he can use daily for gut health. Who doesn't need that? I know I do. I drink it every day. 
It comes in three different flavors, natural, peppermint, and my favorite, pomegranate. You need to try it. The combination of 12 herbs just does a beautiful number on my insides. Right now, they're having their big summer sale. Buy three, get one free. That's right, buy three, get one free. Life Change Tea is not a fad. They've been around since 2007, helping thousands of people, and it's made right in the USA. It's easy to brew, keep it in your fridge, and you drink it daily. It's summertime, and I always want to have a big glass of iced tea. That's why I drink Life Change Tea. Buy now and get one month of tea for free. Go to getthetea.com forward slash Richard to order yours today. Use the code Richard10 to get an additional $10 off plus free shipping. That's over $50 in savings. Again, that's getthetea.com forward slash Richard and use the code Richard and the number 10, Richard10 for $10 more plus free shipping. Don't miss out. You can become an official Patreon supporter of my work here at Strange Planet Productions by donating a monthly amount through patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. There are several tiers to choose from. Pick which one is right for you, but any monthly amount is greatly appreciated. As a sign of my appreciation, you can have your name mentioned on air during my weekly radio show, or you could have your name included in a crawl on my YouTube channel live stream. You could also receive episodes of my old podcast, The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. This critically acclaimed podcast, produced in partnership with Chris Jericho, is not currently available anywhere else. If you enjoy this podcast or my weekly radio program, The Conspiracy Show, you can really get behind me and my work by donating once a month at patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. The truth will set you free, 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 but first it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Josh Peck, author of The Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. Uh, so we were talking about, uh, you know, how Jesus perhaps um, um, influenced the Essenes or, or spoke, um, may have taught the Essenes. And you had a, a, something further to add to that before we move on. Yeah, um, I have to backtrack now and remember my, my last thought. All right, we I were talking about... A particular theory. Um, oh, oh, um, we were talking about John and James. He had, oh, oh, why why he wasn't... Okay, I remember what it was. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, so John may have, according to this theory, may have actually been kicked out of the Qumran community because he was preaching too much love. <laughs> he was preaching too much love stuff. And like, hey, some of our community rule stuff may need some tweaking. There, there's a, an idea that he actually got kicked out of the community and that's why he was wearing what he was wearing and that's why he was eating locusts. But, and that, that theory might be true, but to me, the locust thing seems more likely that that's a way of telling us he was a part of that community. So it could go either way, but it's an interesting theory at least. Uh, this is kind of the, uh, uh, a controversial aspect uh, and I'm sure you've heard about it and argued against it, this whole Dead Scroll conspiracy. I think it was forwarded by one of these Dead Sea scholars, Dead Sea Scroll scholars who um, sort of abandoned his Christian studies to study the scrolls and he was an agnostic. Uh, I think his name was Allegro. And he had this theory that um, that uh, the Essenes, there's so much uh, in their their beliefs and their philosophy that actually you know mirror the Messiah. Uh, they had some individual called the Teacher of Righteousness, and his theory was that the Teacher of Righteousness was Jesus, because they had also within their community they had a council of twelve. Uh, which mirrors, of course, the 12 apostles. They had this communal meal. They had baptisms, as you mentioned, healings. Uh, they talked about the coming of Messiah, all sort of analogous to the story of Jesus. Um, what do you make of that theory? Yeah, to me, it just uh, foreshadows what was what was to come. And yeah, this, this teacher of righteousness uh, figure is really interesting because there is a lot of debate. Uh, as to who this is, it could have been um, an office that was started. Uh, it could have been like, you know, saying like a way of saying like high priest or something like that. It could have been like a job, a, a very high status job. But 
Uh, it could have been a job that for every generation, uh, you know, there would be a new one. Uh, so it could have been that, or it might have been prophetic, and it might have been talking about the Messiah. So opinions are kind of split on that. Um, I tend to think right now that it's it's the Messiah, but I still need more study in this area to really know for sure. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting topic. Uh, Allegra also I had this idea that the as part of their rituals that the Essenes consumed some type of uh, magic mushroom. <laughs> I have not heard that one. Oh, I, I will say though, there were other groups around uh, at the same time calling themselves Essenes, but that weren't practicing Essenes. Just like, you know, we got people that call themselves Christian and you, when you really drill down to it, they don't even know who Jesus is. Uh, they had they had that too. They So there might have been um, a sect that was into that, but there, there were even uh, later on, there were like Gnostic people in Alexandria calling themselves Essenes. And in the Essene community at the time of Christ, they uh, spell out that they had these these uh, like four different heretical groups calling themselves Essenes, and they would they would focus on you know really strange and specific things like uh, you can't carry coins because it's idolatry and th things like that. So you had a lot of uh, heretical groups uh, you know calling themselves Essenes, but that according to the true Essenes weren't really Essene. <laughs> All right, this was, as I mentioned, a short segment, so we'll break away yet again, continue our conversation. Josh Peck, he stays with us the full two hours, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, 2025 and the Final Age of Man. My name is Richard Serrett, back with more in a moment. Guys, we've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that the YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. So let me tell you more about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship, has over 17,000 subscribers and 1 million views. Since March 2020, he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put in $100 into each one, it would now be worth over $53,000. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, is currently up over 440 times from when he said to buy. That one call alone has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 1300 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing and head over to copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. Copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but listeners get full access for just one dollar. You can't find this offer anywhere else, but act fast because the offer ends soon. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. Don't take this offer lightly. He's the real deal. Go visit the site now. If you're a fan of this radio program and the Strange Planet podcast, why not show it off by wearing Strange Planet apparel or drinking from a Strange Planet mug? Check out all the great Strange Planet merch in my Strange Planet shop. Just go to the website strangeplanet.ca strangeplanet.ca and click on shop in the menu. There's a huge selection of men's and women's t-shirts. You like crop circles or the Mayan calendar? Gotcha covered. Are you into the Anunnaki? Wait till you see these designs. My favorite right now? Lions do not lose sleep over the opinions of sheep. And one of our best sellers right now, Truth Gets You Crucified on the front and a passage from Matthew chapter 23 on the back. So many great t-shirt designs, I don't know where to begin. There's women's leggings and tote bags and of course, mugs. Great gifts for family and friends who listen and love this show. My Strange Planet shop. Visit today and often. Just go to strangeplanet.ca and check it out. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. All right, Josh Peck stays with us. The Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. Uh, how do we get a copy, Josh? You can go to skywatchtvstore.com. That is the best place to get it. And uh, 
And if you could leave me a review, an honest review on Amazon, because that helps out too. So uh, should Christians emulate the, the Essenes? Should we, should we follow the way, you know, the way that they conduct them themselves? Well, the great thing is the Essenes were ma mainly the ones that accepted Jesus and spread the gospel. So we already come from the Essenes. There are things that we can and should because it's biblical teaching. But as I mentioned before, the Essenes were not perfect people, as are none of us. So there is a danger in idol uh, uh, idolizing them to the point that we begin trying to do their same rituals. And, and again, some of these would have been things that Jesus corrected, and we're not specifically told all of them. We just know what the correction is. So Christians should act like Christians. And reading the Dead Sea Scrolls and seeing how Christianity began in the first place can help out a lot. But uh, we shouldn't regress back to doing things the way they were done before Jesus came the first time. The Essenes were very much looking forward to Jesus' arrival and the coming of this new age. So it would, uh, you know, they wouldn't have wanted us to, to go back like that. Uh, also, the Essenes were waiting for Messiah's first appearance, and we Christians are waiting for his second. So we definitely have commonality with them. The Essenes, in all likelihood, are our origin story. Uh, but we're not called to follow the Essene way. We're called to follow Christ. Should we follow their calendar? Uh, that's interesting, too. It depends on, I would say, what the reason is and what, uh, um, what, what somebody's trying to get out of it by doing it. So in the sense of learning about it so that we know when things happened in the Bible, uh, possibly, possibly even prophetically, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, but in the sense of it being like, required to do all of these feasts and festivals that are in the Essene calendar? Uh, absolutely not. Um, you know, if somebody wants to observe Passover to kind of know how it was and see how all the all the parts of it point to Jesus, you know, that that's great. If they want to do it on the day that the Essenes say it was, that's great. Um, but just understand, like, if somebody doesn't do that on, like, the Essene day, it's not like God's like not paying attention to that person or, or he's upset about it. Uh, so the, the feasts on the Essene calendar um, pointed towards Jesus. So we're not really required to do them. However, again, like if it's just for learning purposes, doing so, some form of them might be beneficial as long as it doesn't conflict with what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Uh, but, you know, like we have to remember, they were required to sacri sacrifice animals and we're not. There are uh, things in the feasts that... Um, we're not permitted to do today, or even at the time that Gentiles weren't permitted to do. Uh, many of the feasts, because there are, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's some new feasts, there's a couple new feasts mentioned. Um, many of the feasts, we don't have enough information on how they worked or what they were for or, or anything. The scrolls are just too fragmented. So I would say, yes, follow it in the sense of learning about it. Uh, but I would also advise against uh, applying it directly to day-to-day -to -day life and uh, following it the way that the Essenes would have. I should mention too, real quick, if somebody wants a physical copy of that, they can go to dailyrenegade.com and uh, me and Ken Johnson created that. Uh, if they want one on their computer, totally for free, biblefacts.org, and that's uh, Ken Johnson's ministry. So you mentioned um, they had there were extra sort of hidden feasts. You have the, uh, typically you have the seven sacred uh, sacred annual feasts of the old covenant uh, and most you know we're fami familiar with passover and unleavened bread and the first fruits and uh well what we call pentecost and so forth but what were these uh, extra hidden feasts what can you tell us about them and 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 how did they point to the future yeah yeah so most know about the seven feasts that orthodox jewish people observe today but the dead sea scroll uh has as many as 12 so some of these new feast and festival days include uh, first fruits of new wine, uh, first fruits of new oil, and uh, the head of the year. Um, and then pointing to, to something prophetic, it seems that they would, but uh, we don't know how much of uh, how much all of the feasts like how they worked. Uh, we know how Passover works, and we can see how the elements of uh, Passover, the Passover Seder, points to Jesus. Um, so we would assume all of the feasts are like that, that the scrolls are so fragmented, we don't know much. But from what we can gather, it seems like the festival of new wine had something to do with marriage and weddings, possibly pointing to the church being the bride of Christ, or maybe uh, even the union of Jew and Gentile under Jesus. Um, the festival of new oil seems to have something to do with prophecy, but 
uh, we, ju we just don't know much of anything about the actual elements of the feasts. But what does seem to happen a lot, though, is when you map out the day counts from Daniel to Revelation uh, on the Essene calendar, a lot of prophetic events happen some, some, on new, some of those even on new festival days, these, these new feast days that are discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they are important, and I believe, hopefully, someday, in more information about them will be discovered. Uh, it's funny that I was reading recently where even today, and this was something I was totally unaware of, they're, they are finding um, additional fragments. Yeah. Uh, we seem to think, you know, it was all wrapped up in 1957 or whatever, but, and, and there, are, there are fragments that have been uh, found and even advertised for sale in the uh, classified section of the Wall Street Journal. And it's, I mean, I don't know if they've all been, been verified, but what, I mean, have, have we discovered anything recently uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls that tells us anything new about the Essenes or, you know, prophecy? So far, yeah, so far, uh, n nothing really noteworthy. I mean, there are new discoveries being announced every day, uh, it seems like. But uh, the way that it usually works is, is a discovery will be made, and then sometimes the outside world doesn't even know about it for decades. Um, you know, the, the people working on it have other projects, and sometimes it just takes time. So they don't announce it because they want to know everything they can know about it first to make sure what they're announcing is correct. So it, it could be that there have been huge discoveries made already that were just th that haven't been publicly announced yet. So uh, hopefully that's the case because someday they will be and uh, that will be really interesting. Uh, did we get into Daniel uh, 12, uh, 4? I don't think we, we did. We've got a, just a couple minutes here. Uh, why don't we start to begin or why don't we begin rather with Daniel four? Uh, in your book, you, you make this connection um, with our time today and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, so there's a verse in Daniel uh, that says, uh, "An angel's talking to Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased." Now, what's interesting about that run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased, uh, apparently a lot of scholars say when you really dig into that and what that means, that means knowledge about scripture will be increased and people will be running to and fro, you know, b between something and then going back to the scripture to see if it's right. Um, so to the time of the end, many run to and fro, knowledge uh, shall be increased. And then the very beginning of that verse says, but oh, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, which is interesting. So copies of the book of Daniel, of course, were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, now, I'm not saying that this is the main interpretation of that verse, but I find it interesting that literally the words of Daniel were shut up and sealed in jars, and they were discovered when Israel became a nation again. Many say that, um, may, many say is the beginning of the time of the end. That's what a, a lot of people believe. And the second part of that verse is interesting because, uh, again, that to and fro with uh, scripture. So that means that there will be a time people will have a reason to go back and forth to the scripture, always learning more. The Dead Sea Scrolls are basically a huge commentary on the Old Testament. I mean, there are actual commentaries on Old Testament books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so now that we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, our knowledge is increased and we have a lot more context uh, than we used to for how to interpret the Bible. And specifically, there are prophetic things in the book of Daniel that could not be understood without the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically prophecy. Um, like, uh, for example, when most try to figure out the Moedim cycles in Daniel's prophecy, the time, times, and half a time, well, they were using the seven feast or the seven festivals uh, most are familiar with, but the Dead Sea Scroll lists as many as 12. So some of those day counts could fall on feast days. Um, now that, that may not have been exactly what the angel meant when he <laughs> told this to Daniel, but to me, that seems like more than a coincidence. All right, hour two coming up. Josh Peck stays with us. The Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man. Stay tuned for more. <laughs> Richard Serrett's Strange Planet, following the truth wherever it leads, exposing evil and corruption and the secret machinations of powerful elites, revealing the high strangeness beneath the surface of our supposed reality, coming to you from the Great White North and his studio beneath the stairs. Here's Richard.
Thanks for inviting me into your home, your long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Ryan White is our live stream producer. Carlos Kajina is our technical producer. Check out my YouTube and Rumble channel, Strange Planet. And once again, a shout out to three of our Patreon supporters, Tim Sullivan, Deep Paul, and Tim T. Thank you all for your, uh, your generous support. And uh, the money that you give us every month uh, really helps us continue to do the work that we do here at Strange Planet. And if you'd like to become an official donor at Strange Planet, go to patreon.com, patreon.com forward slash Strange Planet. Pick the tier that's right for you, and there are a number of tiers. And uh, as always, whatever you give, your uh, donation is greatly appreciated. All right, we'll uh, continue this hour to delve into the Lost Prophecies of Qumran 2025 and the Final Age of Man uh, with Josh Peck. Once again, Josh, um, tell us how we get a copy of the book. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to skywatchtvstore.com. That's the best place to pick it up. Uh, and if you get that, you'll also get a new book by Ken Johnson, which is actually a compilation of three of his books. Uh, Dr. Ken Johnson did a lot of uh, work on the Dead Sea Scrolls, still does. Uh, he pieced together this calendar uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Absolutely phenomenally brilliant man. Uh, but uh, yeah, so skywatchtvstore.com is the best place to go. So we, in hour one, we were talking about some of these feasts and we were talking about the calendar. So if you, if you use the feasts and the calendar together... Uh, and you try to piece together this prophetic timeline in your book, generally speaking, what, what did you discover? Yeah, well, first I discovered at this moment in time, it's impossible to know for sure when, you know, the rapture will happen or when the tribulation will start or any of that. We're not given exact dates. And uh, like I was saying before, with how the beginning of one age kind of starts a little early, uh, it's, it's impossible to date because of that. And that, that might actually be why God set it up. Um, now, while I do provide several possibilities, I don't set out to prove an exact date um, on any of this stuff. But that being said, uh, I did discover that the day counts and the festival cycles from Daniel and uh, Revelation all seem to work absolutely perfectly on this Essene calendar. And they also help us solve some uh, secondary debates that we Christians have from time to time. For, for example, even among the you know more literalist camp like where I'm from, you know we have uh, debates like, do the two witnesses come in the first half or the last half of the tribulation? Well, if we believe the Essene calendar, they actually must come in the first half. Otherwise, those prophetic day counts, uh, they, they don't work at all. Um, but they work perfectly if they come into the, the the very first one. So that's just one that's one example of how this can be used. But it's it's really interesting how that ties together. Uh, tell me a little bit about the the, the two witnesses. Um, there's some dis discussion or debate as to who these two witnesses are. What role do they play in the end times, and who who do you believe they are? Yeah, um, I'm. I believe one of them has to be Elijah because uh, there's prophecies in the Old Testament about Elijah returning in the end times. Um, the other one, most people think it's either Moses or Enoch. Uh, could be either. I've heard great arguments on both sides, so I'm, I'm not fully sure. Right now, I'm kind of leaning towards Moses, but that could be because that just was the uh, last viewpoint that I happen to be studying. When I study more on the Enoch side, I might <laughs> might switch. But the role of these uh, two people, they're 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 human beings, but they have uh, supernatural powers from God. Uh, you know, they can breathe fire against their enemies. Nobody can take these guys out. Their role in the tribulation is to preach the gospel, to to tell people what's going on. You know, this this guy's the Antichrist. This is the tribulation. All all this stuff. They're there to they're there to preach the truth of Jesus. So while they're there, um, apparently people try to take them out and try, try to kill them, but they're not, they're not able to. But at the end of their ministry, when their ministry is done, the Antichrist himself comes and kills the two witnesses. Finally, the two witnesses are, are, are gone. You know, the world is thinking and they're, they're taken up to heaven. Um, so and then after that, there's an earthquake and, and a lot of people die. But that's, uh, that, that's their main role, their main function 
function in this tribulation period is to preach the gospel of Christ basically one last time for planet Earth. Uh, doesn't it also talk about how, how their their death or execution, if you will, will be seen by everyone all over the world? It almost seems like it's um, prophesizing uh, the advent of television. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think too, because think about that time of, you know, John's having this vision like 2,000 years ago, and he needs to write down that the whole world is going to see this event. And there's, he couldn't think how that would even be possible, but he, he was faithful and wrote it down. It's a bold claim. It's a bold thing to predict, but it actually happened. Um, and there's actually a lot around the death of the two witnesses. Uh, we get a lot of prophetic clues and day counts with, with them. So we know how long their ministry is. We know when they'll die, how they'll die. Uh, and obviously no detail is unimportant, but using the Essene calendar, I believe the two witnesses, uh, like I mentioned, show up in the first half of the tribulation. The Antichrist kills the two witnesses after he desecrates the temple, or before he desecrates the temple, probably. Um, so I believe that it's possible that the two witnesses are killed, but when they, but, but then they are raised during the festival of Purim. Uh, and the day counts actually allow for this, um, and it works out in the in the first half. We also know when the two witnesses are killed, people are giving gifts as these bodies lay in the street. Well, Purim is a celebration that includes public gift giving. It has all of the elements of what we read about that in Revelation. And I've always thought, you know, even when I was a kid reading Re Revelation, I always thought that's weird, gift giving. That's so weird. Uh, and once again, like Dr. Heiser says, if it's weird, it's important. But um, it's a weird detail that it's gift giving. I mean, think about when when we finally got Osama bin Laden, you know, we were we were all happy. We didn't give gifts, though. So it seems like an odd detail. I think it's possible it might be pointing to uh, Purim. Um, now, think of the irony. Purim was started to celebrate Israel being free from a, a tyrannical ruler, Haman. A picture of the Antichrist. So if this is correct, then at this time they will be celebrating Purim to honor another tyrannical ruler, the Antichrist, which totally flips the meaning of uh, Purim around during that time. But we know that uh, we know what their rebellion gets them because, again, right after that is a huge earthquake that destroys a tenth of the city and kills uh, 7,000, it says. Uh, so the um, what is the seventh seal? Um, and uh, the Day of Atonement, the Abomination of Desolation, what do they all have in common? Yeah, this is another really fun one, too. It, it's it's so interesting how this all connects with this one missing element of this, this Essene calendar. Um, so I believe that there's a reason to believe that these all happen on the same time. Uh, we get the, the seventh seal, the Day of Atonement, and the Abomination of Desolation. So Revelation 8 describes the breaking of the seventh seal. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls say that angels perform duties in the heavenly temple at the same time as humans are supposed to be following uh, the, the, the same duties on the earthly temple. That's why it was so important for the priest to get everything right and do, to do it on the correct day. Um, and that's why that calendar is, is so important. So in Revelation, we see scenes of angels actually performing heavenly temple duties. That was another thing I never knew what that was even about, but it, it makes sense now. So when the abomination of desolation occurs in Revelations or in Revelation, the angels are performing duties that sound a lot like what used to be done on the Day of Atonement. Uh, also, using the Essene calendar, the prophetic day counts work out perfectly for this event to occur on exactly that day. Uh, and this also might explain what that silence of half an hour is in heaven. Uh, there's John says that, that when this happens, when the seal breaks, there's a silence for half an hour. Well, why is that? That could be when the Antichrist is desecrating the temple. So these things start to line up uh, in, in these calendar days. It's fascinating. Um. What are some of the best pieces of evidence for a, a pre-trib rapture that um, we might not be aware of? Sure, and you know, I'll, I'll, pref I'll preface this by saying I, I don't, I don't ever argue about this. <laughs> Christians of all rapture camps are Christians. I don't think it's a salvation issue. To me, it's just a fun topic. I, I don't, I don't hold any animosity towards any of the other groups. Uh, but one that I find really interesting is the identity of the 24 elders. So um, if we can show that the 24 elders are actually Christians in resurrected body bodies, then, I mean, that's a slam dunk for the pre-trib view because 
John goes up and uh, they're already there. John describes the 24 elders before Jesus or even the seven sealed scroll um, come, in, come into the picture. So I, I lay it all out in the book, but when you match the description of what the what Christians are promised to inherit described in the first three chapters, it mirrors perfectly with how the 24 elders are described. And to me, again, that's like too big of a coincidence. I mean, uh, if it's not that, I, I don't know how else to make sense of, uh, of, of those two things. Uh, you also write about um, a messenger of, or sorry, uh, or messenger, a resurgence of witchcraft uh, that will occur um, after the, um, what is it called? The retainer? The restrainer. restrainer. What, is, yep. what does that mean, the restrainer? Uh, there's a lot of different ideas about it. Um, I believe that when, when it talks about the restrainer, it's, it's talking about something from one of Paul's letters. And he says that the Antichrist won't come until he, is, he who restrains is taken out of the way. I believe that's the Holy Spirit in believers, but there's other ideas about what that means. So in, in what supernatural ways then is the world going to, uh, to change after the rapture? Well, if I'm, if I'm right, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, uh, and I believe it is, um, we, we're right now we're used to living in a, a materialistic world where magic isn't really seen or believed in among the general public. It's not like, I mean, of course, there's always witchcraft and stuff, but I mean, it's not like a spectacle that everybody can see and we just know that magic is around. We don't we don't live in that kind of world. Um, now, I believe that the, like I said, the Holy Spirit is the restrainer that's removed with us attached at the rapture. Um, now, in the Old Testament, we see a lot of intense magic from, from evil people, like Pharaoh's magicians, for example. And there are even ancient Christian records of the decline of witchcraft around uh, Christians. And th this, is, this is weird. The, the witchcraft would just not work around Christians in the beginning of the church. We have uh, records from Lactantius and Eusebius that uh, show an account of when the false god Apollo was compelled only by the presence of Christians who have the Holy Spirit to actually tell the truth and admit he was demonic. And I have that all in the book. It's fascinating. So it, I think the restrainer is restraining that magic. After the restrainer is removed during the tribulation, we read that people are involved with witchcraft and sorcery again. They don't repent of their witchcraft and sorceries. So imagine how convincing it would be if a world that has never seen real magic all of a sudden uh, sees it in an individual claiming to be the savior of humanity, but he's really the Antichrist. So I believe that we're going to see an actual resurgence of that after the rapture, once that restrainer is removed. Are there anything in the uh, commentaries by the Essenes about an Antichrist? There's a, a very small, uh, there, there's a very little, there's very little bits. <laughs> and, it, and even then it's really speculative because th they don't say antichrist. Um, you know, they, they have other, other terms that, and a lot of times they don't even use man of sin or man of perdition. Uh, there are evil kings and in, in, in what seem to be prophecies throughout the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's hard to know if it's a prophecy of a future antichrist or if it's uh, a, a history uh, or a telling of something that's going on in their time with an evil king. So right now, I, I, I don't know. There might be quite a bit in there. It just depends on how those types of passages are meant to be interpreted. And um, when we read about the millennial age in the Old Testament, there are, there are sacrifices and, and, and festivals going on. Do the Dead Sea Scrolls shed any light on why there are sacrifices after Jesus returns? I mean, that's the old yeah. covenant, right? Sacrifices are the old covenant. Yeah, well, it's actually now we would be in temple law. So the book of Ezekiel um, at the very end, uh, chapters 40 through 48, ex uh, talks about this millennial temple, this millennial world. And at the end, near the end, God tells him to, to say that this is the, the law of the temple. So before it was the law of the Torah. Now we're under the law of Christ. And apparently in the millennial reign, it'll be the law of the temple. Um, so the sacrifices, while it's similar to the law or to the to Torah, it's not exactly the same. Also, uh, in, it, we have to remember that the millennial king, uh, kingdom, it's a mixed crowd of angels, sinless humans and new bodies. And those who survived the tribulation, but who are still normal, mortal human beings with a sin nature. Um, as long as they're believers and they survive, they, they're allowed in. But Ezekiel 44 says 
that the priests who perform the sacrifices in the millennium are able to marry, they have, they have parents who can die, uh, they present sin offerings, and they even sweat. Uh, so these are humans, not glorified uh, human beings. These are humans who have not been resurrected performing these duties. But uh, they are humans that are living in a brand new world that isn't subject to the same sin and death curse that it is now. So it's, it stands to the reason that these humans, after hundreds of years, would eventually forget what, what it took to get them here, you know, uh, the sacrifice that was made that might be part of why they're sacrifices. Um, but we have to remember, too, sacrifices were in the Old Testament were never meant for salvation. Uh, and Hebrew says that, that they were never meant to be understood as providing salvation. They got salvation through faith, like Abraham, his faith was credited to him as righteousness. So salvation has worked the same among all the ages, and it'll be the same in the millennial kingdom too. They'll have to have their faith in Christ and be a follower of Christ uh, to, to be saved. So the sacrifices were never about that. The sacrifices were mainly about atonement with God so that when God came down, they would have this kind of spiritual prote protection against immediate swift justice. Um, and that's probably why, you know, no man can see God and live. It's because of our sin. So the same problem is going to occur uh, in the millennial uh, time that occurred all throughout human history. It's just a different era and a different way of doing things. So uh, yeah, I believe that the sacrifices are literal and I think that they perform a function similar to the Old Testament, but a, a little bit different. And Ezekiel 40 through 48 uh, goes into great detail about that. Uh, there was, you, you mentioned earlier, one of the uh, three Jewish sects, I think it was the, was it the Sadducees or the Pharisees who really didn't believe in, a, in an afterlife? Yeah, Sadducees, they, they shed off a lot of their beliefs. They didn't believe in angels. Um, they, they really abandoned a lot of that stuff because they were just more concerned about making their, their physical lives while they're here as comfortable as, as possible. So uh, what did the Essenes tell us in their commentaries about their, their view of the afterlife? Actually, it goes right in line with uh, what's taught in the Old Testament. So it would it would be that there was a place called Abraham's bosom, which was I, kind of like an Old Testament version of heaven, but it wasn't exactly heaven because at that time no human being was uh, permitted in heaven yet. So, you know, there was this the Sheol, but um, it was uh, like a great chasm divided these two places. There's uh, Abraham's bosom or, or paradise, and then there was basically what we would consider hell. It was, a, it was a holding place for people to be judged who were eventually going to be in the lake of fire. Um, so everything that I've read so far about the, the Essene view of the afterlife, it, was, it, it, it falls in line with that, but they also had this expectation that something was going to change, that, that something was going to change Jesus or you know, the Messiah was going to provide a way to reconcile humanity back to God. And they were looking forward to that age because then they could get saved. And then, you know, when they, when they died, they could go to heaven. Uh, are there any sects in, in um, Israel or, or Jordan who sort of identify themselves as a modern day Essenes? There's a few out there, uh, but not a whole lot is known about them. And th there's even a lot in this country. And I, I would say all of the, the there's people calling themselves a scenes that it's not, it's more like Gnosticism. It's not truly a scene. Um, right now, I don't, I don't, there's not, as far as I know, it would, ha it would have to be really small because I, I, I'm not aware, I'm not aware of it, but I don't think that there's a, a community of like Essenes still living in Israel. I think um, the the believers left and then the ones that stayed behind the unbelief, if there were unbelieving Essenes that didn't accept the Messiah, uh, I, I believe that that when um, 72 AD, when the temple was destroyed, they, they would have been wiped out because it was a massive slaughter. So I think anybody left behind uh, would have been killed. I mean, Paul even said in the, I believe in, in oh, maybe, the, maybe that was Hebrews. But uh, in one of the New Testament books, uh, he's the writer is pleading with the priest to, to get out, come, leave, go to the nations, become a Christian, you know, uh, because we know that this, this major destruction is coming uh, and, and no one's going to survive it. So most likely, there, if there were anybody calling themselves a scenes, it would be somebody who like adopted it later, um, but it wouldn't have been remnants from the, the, the original Essene community.
So what's what's the the, the final takeaway then for for Christians uh, with regards to the Essenes and the uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, one of the one of the biggest reasons that I wrote this book is because this is this is like hidden unknown Jewish history. So there are Jewish people right now that um, believe all, all it all it is is really just the Orthodox and Pharisee and uh, where where all that came from. But there's this whole section of Jewish history that has been uh, completely unknown up until really really recently. So. Right now in our day, um, most Jewish people are either secular or orthodox, which again comes from the uh, from Pharisee teachings, and they they don't even know that there's another option. Um, not many of them. Then there is an extremely rich history full of honor and obedience to God that's completely 100% Jewish. And unfortunately, most Jewish people today don't have access to, to their own history. So if we can help the Jewish people reclaim their history, they'll be more likely to consider Jesus because the Essenes immediately knew who Jesus was when he came and accepted him. So uh, I, th I think helping, helping them out with say like read the dead sea scrolls you got some heritage there and uh if they read that they'll they'll see that it it, it fits really really perfectly with jesus so uh it's a, it's a good ministry effort but even for nothing else i mean they, they should be able to have access to their their history all right josh peck uh the lost prophecies of qumran 2025 and the final age of man back with more in a moment I call it the Miracle Molecule, Carbon 60 or C60 for my good friends at C60Evo.com. And I take a tablespoon every morning. It delivers more than 172 times the power of vitamin C. C60 is a known antiviral, antioxidant, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. It's a remedy that works. C60 Evo users consistently enjoy better sleep and wake up feeling refreshed. This alone is worth the cost of the bottle. I sleep like a baby. I have no aches or pains. Zero. I'm 58, and I don't have a gray hair on my head. Get your miracle in a bottle. C60 from c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. Use the coupon code EVRS at checkout and save an additional 10%. This statement has not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. If you have a medical concern, please contact your healthcare provider. Have you subscribed to my newsletter yet? It's fast, easy, and absolutely free. Just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and then click on subscribe. All I need is your email address, and that's it. Then, once a month, you'll receive my newsletter, Inner Sanctum, in your email inbox. The Inner Sanctum contains a monthly brief, a column of my analysis of the news and opinions. There's a This Month in UFO or Conspiracy History, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of this radio program, a book club, my podcast pick of the month, a spotlight on a previous guest, and much more. Join the Strange Planet community by signing up for your free subscription to Inner Sanctum. Again, go to strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and click on subscribe. It's a strange planet. Read all about it. All right, when we come back, we'll reach out direct to Warsaw and speak with Adam Borowski, writer-translator, about paranormal Poland. Don't go away. The truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. opposed. Third, it is accepted as self-evident. Self You're listening to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. We're going to explore paranormal Poland, and we've reached out to Warsaw, Poland, and uh, Adam Borowski is a translator, writer, author of an upcoming book called Euthanizers. He'll tell us a little bit about that. And uh, we're going to get into some urban legends in Poland, haunted locations, UFOs, missing people, and more. Adam Borowski, welcome. How are you? Hey, Richard. I'm great. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. There's a book called Warsaw's Urban Legends, and it was written by Marek Dabrowski. There's a, a story in there. This is one of the top legends, I understand, in, in all of Poland. It's called 
the Black Volga. What is a Black Volga? Yeah, the Black Volga is a car, as the name suggests, right? Because the, the car and this car it was driven or by, there, there are various um, uh, expressions here, various uh, thoughts, who, who, was, who was the driver, right? Some say it was Satan, some say it was just some kind of uh, uh, or organ trafficking, perhaps. Uh, so various uh, drivers, various mysterious people behind it. And basically this Volga, this car, whoever was driving it was kidnapping children uh, to take them to Germany for organ harvesting or to some other places in the West. That was the general idea. So, um, and of course it connects with vampires and, you know, in a way with uh, missing 411. Uh, so it's a fascinating case uh, because of that, but I guess it could reflect the, um, you know, the times, right, of the communism, uh, which, of course, uh, was the paranoia of, um, uh, you know, people disappearing and the general uh, paranoia of the times. The Black Volga was a, a Russian-made car, I guess. It was very popular with the communist elite. They would drive kind of like a Cadillac. Right, exactly. And, um, of course, it's no, no secret that um, the organ trafficking, you know, human trafficking, the urban legends associated with that, linked to that, were quite popular at that time, especially, you know, a rich Westerner is coming to Poland and needing a new kidney or some sort of organ. And, of course, this Black Volga was um, basically responsible for providing them w with that, right? So this Black Volga was like a symbol of uh, some kind of mysterious force that was there to um, kidnap people so they could be used for organ harvesting and etc. Right. And uh, when was this taking place in Warsaw? Well, that was before the fall of communism. So basically until 1989. Then it's kind of funny because the cars changed to more modern cars, right? But the Black Volga was basically around until 1989 when the real changes started happening, of course, in Poland and indeed the uh, region here in Europe and the Soviet bloc and the surrounding countries. So, um, but this legend is still around, just not the Volga anymore. You're probably going to get a Mercedes, you know, more modern cars now because, of course, we are in a different era. But the idea is the same, that there is this force this mysterious driver who abducts people, mainly children, uh, for organ harvesting and sometimes even human trafficking, right? So this is the, um, the idea behind it. There's a legend about a, a flickering lamppost. And again, this dates back to uh, the communist era. And uh, so tell me about this flickering lamppost in the city. Yeah, apparently this flickering lap goes, this wasn't random, right? This flickering, there was some sort of code, possibly Morse code. It was uh, used by agents, some say Soviet spies, uh, some say maybe even American spies. It's a really interesting case. But of course, you know, with flickering lights, uh, you can't really tell whether there is something to it or not, because lights can flicker for all sorts of reasons, especially in a communist country uh, where, you know, things aren't exactly operating as they should. So um, I wouldn't really put that much stock into this particular legend, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. So there's this blue skyscraper in, uh, in Warsaw, in uh, Bankowy Square. And yeah. uh, it's, it's this huge edifice. It's got these reflexive glass panels. They reflect the blue of the sky. So that's why it's called the blue skyscraper, obviously. Correct. Yeah. 1991. Yeah. How does this relate to it, this urban legend of the rabbi's curse? Right. Well, that's a really interesting story because uh, Warsaw, as some of your listeners may not know, or in Poland before the war, there was a major Jewish presence here before 1939, September 1939. Warsaw's population was one third Jewish. So uh, 1,300,000 people. So that was a lot. Uh, but, you know, when you can when you take one third of that. Now, considering this, uh, the synagogue one of the biggest synagogues in the world was located in Warsaw at the time. And it was destroyed in, on 16th of May, May 16, 1933. 43. Implo 43. Yeah, 43, sorry, yes, that's correct. And, uh, you know, decades later, uh, this skyscraper was, well, they started building it, but they couldn't really completed they couldn't finish it because there were always some problems something was missing there was someone killed and so on and some people speculated that perhaps maybe this rabbi had cursed this plot of land 
you know, as a revenge, as a revenge of sorts that, you know, someone would want to desecrate this area that was sacred. And now they're just building this skyscrapers, the, this skyscraper, this abomination. But it stopped after a while, this curse, it seems. The, the activity, the paranormal activity around the area, and indeed in the building, some say even in the building, there were some kind of strange you know, phenomena, or like, for example, floating uh, items and so on. But apparently... Now it's uh, pretty calm, it stopped. Some speculate that some say that because of the uh, plaque that was put uh, in front of the building or on the building uh, commemorating the synagogue, that maybe that was the reason why it stopped. But the fact is for now it's been, uh, now it's uh, relatively calm, nothing is going on there. Well, sticking with World War II in Warsaw for a moment, there is another uh, legend linked to World War II and it revolves around an, an apparition of a lady clad in a white dress, supposedly haunting the beautiful uh, neoclassical villa uh, in Warsaw on Morski Oko Street. Tell me about it. Yeah, as you know, or some of your listeners again may not know, Warsaw was destroyed in the Second World War. 85% of the city was razed to the ground by the Nazis. And there was a lot of fighting and especially young people were very, very active. And there are many legends, for example, uh, Girl Scouts were really active at that time as well. And in this case, there was this young girl, maybe she was a scout, maybe not, we don't know that, but she hid in this villa, in this beautiful house. And she was staying there for a while. And she saw this uh, handsome young gentleman and she, uh, uh, well, wanted to uh, get out of the house and see where he was, and that's when she was shot, or there was a stray bullet. The point is, she died. And this apparition, this ghost, uh, Hannah's ghost, uh, is now haunting the area. Uh, she's not very aggressive, apparently. She's just walking around. And I remember this case pretty well, because actually, that was one of the cases I have covered uh, for the local television here. So uh, it's a really interesting case. but. As far as I know, she has never been recorded in any way. There were just there are just rumors, right? That this is what happened. So this this villa, this place is definitely um, it's imbued with his history. There is no doubt about it. And um, yeah, it's one of these interesting cases that you have many, many in Warsaw because of the tragic history of the city. I always say that if there is a psychic, because sometimes I listen to psychics who say that, uh, you know, they can sense or see dead people. I cannot imagine, Richard, what they would be seeing here in Warsaw, where you had 200,000 people, civilians, killed in terrible ways, terrible, absolutely terrible ways. Ghost hunting uh, programs are very popular in North America on television. Are they are they also popular in, in Poland? Yes, they are, but I wouldn't say they are as popular as in the US because obviously uh, Poland is, um, well, smaller. For, and Poland is still a uh, Catholic in many ways, right? So um, I think there's a certain, um, people have a certain, uh, well, they don't like they don't like talking about it that much because some people see it as maybe evil, maybe you know demonic. So um, yes, it's popular. But let's take Halloween as an example, right? Just to give you an idea of what I mean. Of course, people celebrate it, but there are many people in Poland who tell you who are going to tell you, well, no, it's not our. Uh, we we shouldn't uh, celebrate this. We have our own holidays. We have our own celebrations, uh, and we should not, uh, you know just cater or think about this or uh, just uh, look at to the West, right? That's basically the message here. So I think it's the same with uh, ghost shows. These shows are kind of different uh, because of tragic Polish history mainly, right? You have so many uh, cases here, as I said, with, with Warsaw, for example, and uh, you don't really have that in America for obvious reasons. So yes, uh, it's popular, but you need to remember that um, Many people see this as sort of uh, maybe evil, maybe demonic because of religious undertones. Adam, we'll take a quick time out. We co we'll come back and continue to uh, delve into paranormal Poland with writer, translator, author Adam Borowski. Stay with us. A trusted sponsor of my show, GetTheTea.com, is having their summer sale. 
Hey guys, let's talk about Father's Day. What kind of gift would you like to give your dad? Why not think about a gift that would help his digestion? Remember, Life Change Tea is an amazing gentle cleanse that he can use daily for gut health. Who doesn't need that? I know I do. I drink it every day. It comes in three different flavors, natural, peppermint, and my favorite, pomegranate. You need to try it. The combination of 12 herbs just does a beautiful number on my insides. Right now, they're having their big summer sale. Buy three, get one free. That's right, buy three, get one free. Life Change Tea is not a fad. They've been around since 2007, helping thousands of people, and it's made right in the USA. It's easy to brew, keep it in your fridge, and you drink it daily. It's summertime, and I always want to have a big glass of iced tea. That's why I drink Life Change Tea. Buy now and get one month of tea for free. Go to getthetea.com forward slash Richard to order yours today. Use the code Richard10 to get an additional $10 off plus free shipping. That's over $50 in savings. Again, that's getthetea.com forward slash Richard and use the code Richard and the number 10, Richard10 for $10 more plus free shipping. Don't miss out. You can become an official Patreon supporter of my work here at Strange Planet Productions by donating a monthly amount through patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. There are several tiers to choose from. Pick which one is right for you, but any monthly amount is greatly appreciated. As a sign of my appreciation, you can have your name mentioned on air during my weekly radio show, or you could have your name included in a crawl on my YouTube channel live stream. You could also receive episodes of my old podcast, The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone. This critically acclaimed podcast, produced in partnership with Chris Jericho, is not currently available anywhere else. If you enjoy this podcast or my weekly radio program, The Conspiracy Show, you can really get behind me and my work by donating once a month at patreon.com forward slash strange planet, patreon.com forward slash strange planet. The truth will set you free, free, free. But first, it will really tick you off. Welcome back to Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. Welcome back. Adam Borowski stays with us from Warsaw. We're talking paranormal Poland. How about for you, uh, Adam? Any um, paranormal activity in your life? Yeah, there was some some interesting cases. Um, well, there was one particularly interesting case uh, of um, ghost. Apparently, there was a ghost or is a ghost at an abandoned uh, police station. And I had a chance to talk to a detective uh, who didn't really believe that, but his friend apparently had seen this, uh, this, this supposedly this ghost. So this was interesting to me because, you know, police officers aren't known for making things up most of the time. So it was very, very different than just some uh, witness or someone like that. I did have an interesting EVP recorded as well uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, which was a voice. It was addressing me directly, and there is no way it was, uh, you know, it was um, someone walking around or just some kind of person. No, it was definitely uh, some kind of unnatural voice. It was a floating voice. It was a woman's voice. It was like someone floating away, and there is no way that she was anywhere near me at that time. So, because I, I checked it many times, I went over this, this I've gone over this scenario many times and really interesting. And it really gave me a, a chills, right? Because it was, because um, she was ad addressing me directly. And that was really, really fascinating to me. I was really skeptical about, you know, EVPs and uh, all this stuff. But then after that, there is definitely something to it. Well, but what, in what were the yeah. circumstances in, under which you recorded this EVP? Where were you and, and uh, what happened? I was here. There's a huge graveyard, a huge cemetery here, Povonsky. It's, it's in Warsaw. It's a really fascinating place. Uh, there were huge fights happening there, huge battles um, in the Second World War. Uh, like I said, with the uh, young Polish people fighting Nazis. Uh, Nazi Germany or um, Nazis in general. And there was a lot of fighting going on there because, of course, they were hiding there. The young Poles were hiding there. Uh, you know, so it was a, uh, it's a huge cemetery. Uh, I went there around the time of Halloween. But here in Poland, we have the 
All Souls Day, you know, more the Slavic tradition. So instead of what, what's happening in the West, what, what people do in the West, like, you know, the uh, trick and treat and so on here, it's more, as it's usually the case uh, uh, in Poland with Poland, uh, it's more solemn. It's more, uh, let's say, you know, this kind of sad, right? Uh, you do remember your uh, ancestors, yes, but it's more like in terms of uh, going to the grave and just standing there and uh, and talking about this person, you know, that had passed away. So it's kind of different. Um, so so I went to the cemetery. You know, I had this small mic because it was uh, even then it was this kind of technology was different. But I had this small mic uh, on me, and I was just um, I just. Uh, let's say had this suggestion or this made this suggestion, this mental suggestion, that if there is anything there, let it uh, record itself, right? And this voice had imprinted itself, let's put it this way, uh, on my recorder. It wasn't even a digital recorder. It was some kind of, you know, very, very old recorder. And it was, um, well, a really interesting case, no doubt about it. But again, if I played it to someone, Without this context, without being there, it means nothing, right? Because these experiences, you need to be there and experience them yourself, which is why um, I know it's real because I experienced it. I've uh, recorded this and there was definitely intelligence behind it. And there is no way it's uh, been said by anyone around me at the time. It's like this voice has inserted itself at a specific moment when it knew when to, when to do it, which is amazing. And that's, one, that's why I know EVPs are very much a reality. What's behind them? I have no idea. Uh, you know, it depends on your belief system, but this is definitely uh, fascinating. But in terms of paranormal, as in, you know, some people talk about being taken to spaceships and so on, I would never make that claim. Even if something like this happened to me, I would never, you know, say it openly because uh, without evidence, without proof, you know, I'm the kind of person that uh, I don't think it would make any sense, right? I know there are people claiming all sorts of things, but in my opinion, based on my experiences, uh, if someone really had gone through an experience like that, it's highly unlikely that they would have, uh, you know, talked talked about it. Because from a psychological point of view, from a psychological standpoint, um, I just don't think it's logical. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you know, people that talk about you know alien abductions and so on, maybe there is indeed, you know, maybe it's maybe it's what happened to them, right? But when I imagine myself in that scenario psychological level of psycho level of uh, shock mm, i don't think that it's that easy right because it's absolutely uh, you know what i'm talking about well, traumatized it's, you're traumatized yeah a lot yeah of, exactly it can, change, so, it can change your entire view of reality and that's too much for some people to be able to process. yeah exactly exactly and i just don't think that uh people that talk about it openly well some could say well yeah because it's their method of coping but i'm more inclined to believe uh you know, there are cases of people who just uh, shut down. They didn't want to talk about anything of the sort of this kind of stuff. I'm more inclined to believe that people have really powerful experiences involving the paranormal or some kind of, you know, paranormal related. I think it's highly unlikely that they would be talking about it openly. It can happen, but it's um, highly unlikely in my opinion. All right, Adam, stay put. We'll be back on the other side with more on Paranormal Poland. Guys, we've seen so many people making ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that the YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy him. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. So let me tell you more about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship, has over 17,000 subscribers and 1 million views. Since March 2020, he's told his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put in $100 into each one, it would now be worth over $53,000. Of the 26 coins, his top pick of the year, a coin called Phantom, is currently up over 440 times from when he said to buy. That one call alone has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. 
you can go to YouTube and verify this for yourself. So if you'd like to join the 1,300 members who copy James, then stop what you're doing and head over to copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. Copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but listeners get full access for just one dollar. You can't find this offer anywhere else, but act fast because the offer ends soon. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash dollar. That's D-O-L-L-A-R. Don't take this offer lightly. He's the real deal. Go visit the site now. If you're a fan of this radio program and the Strange Planet podcast, why not show it off by wearing Strange Planet apparel or drinking from a Strange Planet mug? Check out all the great Strange Planet merch in my Strange Planet shop. Just go to the website strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and click on shop in the menu. There's a huge selection of men's and women's t-shirts. You like crop circles or the Mayan calendar? Gotcha covered. Are you into the Anunnaki? Wait till you see these designs. My favorite right now, lions do not lose sleep over the opinions of sheep. And one of our best sellers right now, truth gets you crucified on the front and a passage from Matthew chapter 23 on the back. So many great t-shirt designs, I don't know where to begin. There's women's leggings and tote bags and of course, mugs. Great gifts for family and friends who listen and love this show. My Strange Planet shop. Visit today and often. Just go to strangeplanet.ca and check it out. It's time to redefine reality. This is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. We are back with Adam Borowski, writer, translator, on the line from Warsaw, Poland, and we're talking paranormal Poland. Let's set aside the paranormal for a moment, Adam, and there is so much tragedy that has occurred in Poland over its history. Talk to me about some locations in Poland that that are tied to some of these tragedies during the Second World War. We could talk about one place here, if you don't mind, just nearby. It's also a very interesting place. It's called Zofiówka. It was uh, before the Second World War. It was a hospital for um, Jews with mental problems. The Second World War, first you had the T4 action. Now, T4 was basically euthanasia by Nazi. Nazi Germany had this program of euthanasia of the so-called undesirables, right? T4. And it was um, done throughout Germany, of course, and uh, in occupied areas. So that's what they did here. Some of the doctors, they actually killed themselves in protest because they knew it was going to happen to their patients. So they said, no, we don't like this. And they committed suicide in, in protest. And then you had Lebensborn. Lebensborn was an organization that was responsible for the forced Germanization of Polish kids or some Polish kids that were deemed to be Aryan, right? Aryan characteristics. So that there was then, then you had after T4, you had this uh, Lebensborn program. Now, what's interesting about this place is that there is a very strong paranormal angle there. So when you enter this, this hospital, or it, it's no longer a hospital, but, but it's still the building is still there, there are really strange drawings on the walls so it's, the atmosphere is just eerie it's a really strange place and i have no doubt whatsoever that it someone were to conduct or you know record evps there i'm sure you would get a great great results no doubt whatsoever given this place's history absolutely a crazy history even for polish standards and i'm sure you would get really really interesting results And um, it's a great place in terms of, you know, urban exploration and the paranormal, but in terms of the history, absolutely tragic, tragic, and uh, just shows you the level of depravity that humans are capable of. I want to talk about Wolf Gregorievich Messing. Um, Oh, yes. He he was actually, he was a Russian, wasn't he? He was Polish. He was Russian. He was Jewish, you know, because Poland was controlled, uh, you know, the Russian Empire was uh, controlled by Russia for a long time. So at that time, it was part of the Russian Empire. So he was uh, three things, uh, three nationalities at the same time. So Polish, Jewish, and Russian, or Soviet, to be more precise. Yeah, he claimed to have the power to project any kind of image uh, he wanted to uh, you to see. So, for example, there is this story that Stalin told, asked him, okay, you're so great, 
messing. Okay, here's what I want you to do. You are to enter my villa. And if you can do this, I'll believe you. And apparently, in other words, messing... is, in other words, sneak past the guards disguised, exactly. project, projecting another image. He could make people believe he was whoever Beria wanted them to and believe. The chief of police that was absolutely a, a monster. And they, they saw the guards swore they saw Beria. He was the chief of police. So uh, truly an amazing story. Whether Messing really had these powers, well, we don't know, but he was famous and he basically claimed that uh, he could, you know, like he was the mentalist, the ultimate mentalist. He uh, could uh, make you believe that, let's say, you were holding paper and there was actually, uh, you know, a lot of money. Uh, so really, a really interesting individual. Messing became Stalin's personal wizard, I understand. Yes, and Stalin apparently was uh, afraid of Messing. Apparently, Stalin was afraid of Messing, which was, uh, well, this was quite a feat, if that's, if that's true. And apparently, Hitler hated Messing because Messing uh, prophesied or predicted that Hitler would be uh, destroyed when he turned east. But of course, you, you, know, you could say that was just a savvy political uh, prediction. Uh, so I guess that's possible, too. Yeah, and of course, uh, Messing was Jewish, so obviously, you know, I don't need to explain that and tell you that the Nazi ideology, well, that was a problem, right? Uh, so obviously, Messing was uh, avoiding uh, uh, Nazi Germany like the plague for obvious reasons. So, um, yeah, it's for a very interesting story. And there's another story we could talk about, Richard, uh, Stefan Ossowiecki. Uh, oh, this is Polish the gentleman that predicted his own death. That's right. He predicted his own death in the Warsaw Uprising. He was an engineer, and apparently, uh, you know, he was famous before the war. Uh, Sigmund Freud knew about him or was friends with him, apparently, Albert Einstein. So he was well known in, in, you know, before the war. And yes, he was an engineer. So he wasn't just some, you know, person that making things up in the sense that he understood the uh, very basis of how, how the things work. And this gave him credibility, of course. And he, yes, he said that his body was never going to be found. And he even specified the date when he was going to get killed, where he was going to be killed. But again, whether that was actually the case, you know, Warsaw Uprising, that was the beginning of the Warsaw Uprising, chaos, uh, Germans burning buildings to the ground. Well, not at that point, but, but close. So, you know, it's not very difficult to predict, yeah, my, you're not going to find my body. I mean, that, that scenario, just imagine the Ukraine now, right? Um, it's not exactly a prediction, but uh, he was definitely famous at the time before the war and during the war. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting, really interesting person because, you know, Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein, I don't think that they would... Uh, they wouldn't have been fascinated by this individual, by this, uh, by this man, if there wasn't, hadn't been something to his claims, right? As you say, he may have been killed by the Gestapo during the Warsaw Uprising, and that's why, you know, his, yeah, body, his body was never that's, found. But that's the story, Richard. But again, given the chaos, we don't really know, right? Because there was so much chaos going on that that's the story is that Gestapo got to him. But whether that's actually what happened, we just don't know. You know, it's as I said, two hundred thousand civilians dead. So you can imagine the level of chaos we're talking about, the mayhem. Uh, so yeah, the, but the story is that um, yeah, that he was killed by the Gestapo. Yes. What about his psychic abilities? What can you tell us uh, about his uh, clairvoyance? Yeah, he could predict the future. Apparently, he could tell with uh, incredible accuracy, you know, some events from people's lives that, you know, they never shared with anyone, uh, stuff like that. So um, it was definitely interesting uh, for people. But again, some people claim that, you know, basically, he was a clever psychologist. He could uh, see things, notice things kind of like missing uh, Wolf Wolf missing the previous uh, gentleman we talked about. So, yeah, it was. Um, Again, it's very it's hard to really tell whether this was genuine because some would say that it's just a conjuring tricks like, you know, he was uh, kind of like a psychic that was uh, a pretend psychic that would, you know, kind of move chairs, you know, or something like that. But, you know, it's definitely someone that uh, has a place in history. Right. Let's let's put it this way. Well, by the way, just uh, one important thing i guess uh, that he could have or he could do or he claimed to do he could see objects in sealed containers and he could travel outside the body and there was actually one friend that said um, 
that he could uh, talk about this conversation this friend was having. But again, uh, this is all rumors, right? Just like the, the, this, this, this part with his body um, not being found. Because remember, the chaos at that time, I would love to believe this is a real you know, psychic, that he was a real psychic. But again, uh, given how things are and how things were, I, I'm kind of skeptical, right? Adam Borowski, translator, writer, and author living in uh, Warsaw, Poland. You have a, you've been working on a new book, a piece of fiction, and it's uh, called Euthanizers. And can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure, Richard. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Right. So um, euthanizers are basically individuals that, you know, the concept we know from history and from science fiction in general that want to steal other people's lives, uh, what I call dimensional one percenters. So they see someone who has a better life and they analyze this other, that they're double. So their counterpart in this other universe that they want to live in, they analyze everything about this person. And then they just cross over and they kill this individual in ways that doesn't leave a trace. And then this, the body of this individual is thrown back to the, or the dimension they came from. But the idea, the overarching idea, because euthanized is just part of it, is the demiurge, of course. I'm fascinated by the concept of the soul trap, right? That the light that people talk about, that it's this great light, that it's actually a trap. Again, this concept has been around for thousands of years, probably. So I'm fascinated by the demiurge. So actually my novel, is told from the point of view of the demiurge. And the euthanizers are a part of it. And there are some uh, funny parts involving various nations getting punished. Uh, I'm deliberately being vague because I think it's an interesting story to read. And uh, I really think it has potential. And I'm not just saying it because, you know, I've, I've written it. So, you know, that's I'm just uh, stroking my own ego. No, I think it really has potential. And I'm really, really happy because, uh, yeah, uh, with, with, with what I'm, you know, what I've, what I've written, basically. Euthanizers and uh, by Adam Borofsky, you're looking for a publisher and people can find out more information and I guess read, uh, read some snippets from the book at Escaping Hazmat Demons. That's the Facebook page, Escaping Hazmat Demons, right? And they can contact you via email, adam.borofsky, that's B-O-R-O-W-S-K-I, Adam. Dot Borofsky, B O R O W S K I, 1985 at gmail.com. And I'll put the, uh, the, fa- the link to the Facebook page and your email address in the episode notes. Okay, Adam. Richard, that's, that's great. Thanks. Thanks again. It's, uh, it's been a nice chat, uh, this different Polish perspective. All right. That's it for me. Thanks to Carlos and Ryan back next week as we take a look at the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in and cover-up with U.S. Attorney John O'Connor. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night. A new Richard Serrett's Strange Planet drops every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Subscribe at strangeplanetpodcast.com.